Hello, welcome. My name is Dr. Lindsay Crawford, and I am a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and an assistant professor with uh, UT Houston. Today, we're going to talk about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Today, we're going to cover uh, from the beginning the definition of adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, how do we get this diagnosis, what is the step in orthopedic evaluation for this condition, and what are treatment options for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. So let's start with the beginning here. What is scoliosis? Scoliosis is a condition that causes the spine to curve sideways, as you can see in the photograph below. The bones of the spine actually twist or rotate as the child grows, which causes either a C or an S shape of the spine. And visually, you'll see uneven shoulders or waist potentially as a result of this rotation. There are several types of scoliosis. One type of scoliosis is congenital, in which the bones of the spine do not fully form or are fused together. This is from birth and is often recognized in infants. Second type of scoliosis is neuromuscular. This is associated with medical conditions such as cerebral palsy or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Today we're going to focus on talking about idiopathic scoliosis. Idiopathic is the fancy word to mean undetermined cause. So idiopathic scoliosis is our most common cause of scoliosis. It's over 80% of scoliosis. Again, as I mentioned before, the exact cause is not known. These patients are usually otherwise healthy with no medical problems. While we don't know the detailed cause, it's believed to be multifactorial or have several factors that lead to it. We do think there is a genetic component um, as we have noticed that 30% of the patients have a positive family history of scoliosis. But that does mean that in most of our patients, there is no family history or anyone in the family that has scoliosis as a diagnosis before. We do know that it's not related to activities, so no certain sports or things such as carrying a heavy backpack lead to the scoliosis. We further divide up idiopathic scoliosis based upon the age of onset. If they're less than three years old, a patient will have a diagnosis of infantile idiopathic scoliosis. Three to 10 years old is juvenile, and greater than 10 years old is adolescent. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. As an abbreviation for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, it's often re referred to as AIS. The overall prevalence of uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is in the literature from 0.5 to 5% of the population. And it has a significant female predominance with a female to male ratio of 1.5 to 3 uh, to 1. And it's particularly noted that the females tend to have the more severe curves. So, and our curves that we find are greater than 40 degrees are the more severe scoliosis it's even more noticed um, that there's a lot of females um, at 7.2 to uh, 1, a male to female ratio. So a lot of the patients that we're treating for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis are actually females. So next we'll talk about what are symptoms? What are things that you may notice in yourself or you may notice in your child that would bring you in for evaluation for scoliosis? Um, one thing you may notice is uneven shoulders, with, or you may notice that one shoulder blade is protruding or looks more prominent than the other. Summertime is a common time when kids are in swimsuits and out at the pool that some of these um, things may be noticeable that you hadn't previously noticed. Another thing may be the prominence of ribs on one side compared to the other. This can be noted from the front or the back, as well as an uneven waistline. Also, sometimes parents notice that when the kid bends over, for example, when they go to brush their teeth, that they have a hump on their back. Um, these things are often noticed after the child has a growth spurt for the first time. So what brings patients in to see us? This usually comes in three different ways. One, a parent or family member notices one of these um, asymmetries and brings the patient in for evaluation. Number two, 
Um, the school nurses um, do scoliosis screening through school and sometimes it is uh, noticed that there's a concern for spinal curvature and they're referred to us from the school for evaluation. Or number three, uh, sometimes the pediatrician on their annual exam will notice a spinal curvature and send them to us for further evaluation. With regards to symptoms, scoliosis generally does not cause pain. This can be a little bit complicating though because adolescents often have low back pain issues. Um, there are patients that have scoliosis and have back pain. Um, sometimes though, this back pain is not related to the curvature of the spine. Oftentimes, low back pain in adolescents is more related to weak core or back muscles, um, having tight hamstrings and not stretching, or activity level, which is either that they're always participating in sports year round, or that they're very sedentary and not participating in many activities. So once they're referred to the orthopedic surgeon, we're going to start off with a history to start our evaluation. Uh, the first thing for that would be whether there's any perceived deformity. If this was something that uh, the patient, the family, or the pediatrician, or again, as mentioned before, the school nurse in screening noticed a deformity. And when was it first noticed? Another evaluation is going to be whether the child's hit puberty or not. Oftentimes, a new deformity is noted after a recent growth spurt. That's because the scoliosis will change as the child grows, and when a growth spurt is hit, it often becomes more obvious um, the deformity of the scoliosis. Also, to give us an idea of how much growth is left in the child, uh, we ask if the boys are hitting puberty, getting change in the voice, and also for the girls, whether they've started their periods or not. Uh, we also review whether there's any family history of scoliosis. We'll also ask your child um, about whether they're having any back pain, which again may not be present at all, even in the presence of scoliosis, or they may have um, back pain whether scoliosis is present or not. We also ask them about neurologic symptoms. So you'll hear lots of questions about any numbness or tingling present in the arms or legs, any weakness um, or difficulties with activities, and also we'll ask about if there's any issues with getting to the restroom when they need to go to the bathroom, if they're wetting their bed or having any issues with their bowels. These questions are actually related to the spine, the spinal cord and nerves. Also, we ask if they have any limitation in their activities. Again, this could relate back to pain or potential neurologic issues. With regards to the patients that report back pain, just want to emphasize that again, scoliosis is not a degenerative condition in children. So while we often think of back pain and we think of things like arthritis or disc disease, um, this is not the case in the children with scoliosis. There is pain in about 20 to 30% of children with scoliosis. So again, the majority of patients with scoliosis do not have any back pain. And again, we are gonna do a careful neurological exam to make sure that there's no abnormalities um, there or anything that could be causing the pain. And for the most part, these are actually um, low back or periscapular muscle spasms and often resolve with physical therapy. So many times if it's just isolated back pain we'll actually refer the patient for physical therapy to help decrease the back pain they're having. If there's anything concerning on the exam uh, as far as neurologic findings or any concerns in what the patient is telling us that they're feeling as far as symptoms then we would potentially order an MRI to further evaluate. Next, we have the examination. After we finish taking all the history, we'll take a look at the child. The first thing we're looking at is going to be um, the back and chest, and we're gonna be looking for the deformities associated with scoliosis. Um, we are looking for whether there's a prominence of one shoulder blade or the other, as well as any prominence of one flank to the other. We'll also look at the shoulder height and see if there's any asymmetry between the two shoulders as well as whether the waist is level or if there's any asymmetry. 
because uh, scoliosis is a rotational problem, there can also be breast asymmetry noted from the front, particularly in our female patients, this can be noticeable. Uh, we'll also look at the overall balance of the um, head over the pelvis. Oftentimes with scoliosis, the patient can be shifted from one side or the other, where the head is more to the left or the right of the body. This is an image demonstrating just that. Um, you see on the left the normal spine with the head centered uh, over the center of the body, whereas with the scoliosis, the patient's more lean to the right. To better uh, emphasize uh, the abnormality that we can see with scoliosis, we'll actually ask the patient to bend forward. This is known as the Adams Forward Bend Test. And this is actually what uh, pediatricians and school nurses will do for screening for scoliosis. We'll place our fingers over the iliac crest to make sure there's no leg length discrepancy and that the, that the uh, pelvis is balanced. We'll make sure the patient keeps both legs straight with no bending of the knees and ask them to reach for their toes. The physician or nurse will view them from behind, sitting so that the eyes are leveled with the back and we're gonna look for any asymmetry between the left and the right side. It is possible that the patient can have some asymmetry when there's actually no scoliosis present. There's also a possibility that the patient can have some scoliosis without significant asymmetry. Here's a picture of the Adams Ford Ben test. This patient, while standing, though does have some asymmetry, it's not near as noticeable as it is when they bend forward on the Adams Forward Bend Test, which really emphasizes the asymmetry from the left to the right side. The reason for this is because scoliosis is actually a three-dimensional deformity. Scoliosis is often thought of as just the uh, plane on the left where there's an S or C shape curve in the spine, but there's actually a rotational deformity where the bones of the spine are actually twisted and rotated. So therefore, when the patient leans forward, that rotation becomes a prominence or a hump that can be visualized. As we continue with our exam, we'll check for the full range of motion of the back as well as look for any tenderness um, to palpation in the back or along the muscles of the back. We'll also do a full neurologic examination, checking things including strength, sensation, reflexes, and muscle tone for any abnormalities. We'll also assess your child for any other potential causes of scoliosis. So we'll check for any cafe au lait spots, which would be large birthmarks, as well as any uh, dimpling or a hairy patch on the back these things could potentially uh, lead us to a cause of the scoliosis. After examination is done, if there's a concern for scoliosis, we'll proceed with uh, radiographs or x-rays. The x-rays are taken in a standing position and we do x-rays of the entire spine um, to include from the neck all the way down through the pelvis. We'll take a picture from the back as well as one from the side. From there, we'll be able to measure the curve of the spine. This measurement is called a Cobb angle. Any Cobb angle that's greater than 10 degrees is con considered scoliosis. Here's an example of the radiographs taken from the front and from the side. Again, the reason why we take radiographs in more than one uh, plane is because the scoliosis is three-dimensional, so we have to visualize it in more than one plane. So from there, we'll measure the Cobb angle. So this shows you an example of how we do this. We try and find the vertebra or uh, bone of the spine that is most curved, and we'll pick the one at the top and the bottom of that curve. The angle between those two gives us our Cobb angle. This is important because this is going to guide our treatment planning. We also look at the side view. On here, we find that the patient usually has a decreased kyphosis or decreased round back appearance of the spine. With scoliosis, the patients will have more of a flattened back. 
but you may notice that it seems like the back is very round, but this is actually secondary to um, an imbalance in the ribs from side to side. So the ribs may be very prominent, as noted on the lower ribs in this patient, and that can give the appearance of having a round back when the actual spine itself is flattened. Sometimes your physician will also order further x-rays in order to look at how flexible the curve is. They can do these supine bending films in which the patient will bend from side to side in order to see if the curve is flexible or not. This can help in guiding treatment. With regards to proceeding with getting an MRI for scoliosis, MRIs are not routinely ordered for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, though there are certain reasons why we would order an MRI. The MRI does allow for our evaluation of the spinal cord and to look for any abnormalities. Reasons to order an MRI would be if the patient's having significant back pain, if they have any neurologic symptoms or findings on the exam, if they have any of what we call atypical curves, which the physician would note on the x-ray and discuss with you. Um, curves that are progressing or becoming um, higher in number very quickly. And sometimes physicians will order this before any surgery on the back as a part of planning for surgery. Now that we've discussed the workup that will happen when you go to see a physician, We'll talk about the treatments um, that are available for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis once the diagnosis is made. Treatment is gonna be based on several factors. One is gonna be the age of the child, which is also gonna to relate to the amount of growth remaining. The amount of growth remaining is really important in the treatment of scoliosis because scoliosis grows while the child grows. So depending on how much growth remaining, will help us to figure out if the curve is going to continue to progress. Also keeping in mind that this is very different for boys and girls. Girls tend to grow till about two years after they reach uh, menarche, which is when they start their periods. Obviously that is also variable from one individual to another. One girl may start her period at 10, while another one doesn't start till 14. Therefore we would expect a difference in the time that they will continue to grow. Boys tend to grow uh, until a later age than girls. They tend to grow till about 16 to 18 years of age. So this is important consideration in treatment for scoliosis. Other factors we look at are gonna be the severity of the curve, which is the Cobb angle that'll be measured on the x-rays, as well as the location of the curve. We look at what part of the spine the, the curve is in, and this can also affect your treatment planning. To discuss a little further growth remaining, we're able to look at the x-ray that we take of the spine where we include the pelvis. As you see in this picture on the left, um, this is showing a pelvis and explaining what is called a risser sign. The uh, physician is going to look at the x-rays and look at the pelvis. And I call this the little eyebrow on the pelvis. It's a um, growth plate that begins on the outside of the pelvis and works its way to the inside of the pelvis and finally closes. That helps us to know how much growth remaining is present until what we call skeletal maturity, which is when the bones are no longer growing. Children will have their peak height velocity, which is what we're talking about here on the right, which is when they're growing the fastest. This actually occurs before we start seeing this eyebrow closing on the x-rays. So for females, this is before they have their periods. They'll hit a big growth spurt, and then after that, they'll begin their periods. This, again, just helps us because scoliosis is gonna be the most progressive during the peak height velocity. This is also why a lot of our patients come in after a big growth spurt. There is likely some degree of scoliosis there, and when they hit their growth spurt, all of a sudden it got worse and it became noticeable. So, looking a little more detail about the risk factors for progression. Uh, number one, females are at higher risk. If you remember back at the beginning, 
I discussed about how it's a seven to one ratio of females having high degree curves compared to males. Uh, number two, the remaining growth. This is what we just discussed. So the curve progression is going to be maximum during the peak height velocity and then decrease after that. While the child is growing though, there's the potential for the scoliosis to progress or increase. Number three is gonna be curve magnitude. So curves that are greater than 25 degrees in a skeletally immature or growing patient have a high risk of progression. Curves that are greater than 50 degrees in a patient at skeletal maturity that's done growing are at risk to continue to progress. Number four is also going to be curve pattern, which again is um, how the curve looks, the location in the spine, if it's a C or if it's an S. So the treatment options for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis fall into three main treatment categories. That's going to be number one, observation, number two, bracing, and number three, surgery. So we'll discuss each of these. So observation is going to be selected for curves that are less than 25 degrees in younger patients. And that's because uh, though the patients have a lot of growth remaining, the curve is not yet severe. I do tell these patients that because they are young, there is a potential that their curve would become more than 25 degrees at some point in our observation time and require that we change our treatment plan. In patients that have curves less than 45 degrees and our patients that are either done growing or close to being done growing, these are ones that we can also observe. So in this category, you can see that there are some patients that have a significant curvature, but because of the fact that they're done growing, we aren't expecting that curvature to get worse. The plan would be to follow up with x-rays, depending on your physician, this would be every four to 12 months, um, and we will continue to follow until the patient is fully grown to assess for any progression of the curve. Also in larger curves, um, in patients that are done growing, we'll often continue to follow on a yearly basis to ensure that we don't see any progression, even after the end of growth. As I mentioned before, if the patient um, is having any back pain, even though we're playing for observation of the scoliosis, we would still recommend uh, treatment with physical therapy in order to address the back pain that they're having. The second category for treatment is bracing. So curves between 25 to 45 degrees fall into a category that is amenable to bracing. And these are for our patients that are still growing. So important things with bracing. Number one, it's really important to note that bracing is not going to correct the existing to curve. I feel like this is a definite point of confusion because when the patient is wearing the brace and we take an x-ray in the brace, the curve looks better because the brace is actually made to push on the curve in order to keep it from progressing. But again, I wanna emphasize that we don't expect the brace to actually correct the curve. Number two, the goal of the brace is to actually prevent any progression of the curve moving forward. So for example, a patient that has a lot of growing left to do and already has a 30 degree curve. Well, we would be worried that this curve would become quite significant by the time they're done growing because they have several years of growing left. So therefore, we'll put them into the brace treatment in order to try and hold that curve at that 30 degrees until they finish growing. So as I just mentioned there, the treatment's going to continue until the patient's done growing. So depending on the patient, the time that we'll treat in the brace is gonna be variable. And that will be determined and can be discussed with you, with your physician, again, gonna be based on the age of the patient and how much growing they have left to do. There are many different types of braces available uh, and a variety of uh, different concepts. Many of these braces have been used for years, particularly the more rigid braces, which would be TLSO or Boston style braces, have been studied the most. 
On the lower left hand corner, you can see a Charleston bending brace, which is a brace that's actually made specifically for nighttime. In the upper right hand corner, you can see one of our newer braces. These uh, braces are called spine core and they use more straps and Velcro versus being a rigid brace. Different physicians may have different preferences on the type of brace that they use. It's just important to ask them uh, any questions you may have as to what the best brace for that particular patient is. Because again, we'll have patients with different types of curves, different types of bodies, and different ages. So one brace may be better than the other. So I mentioned a little bit about um, bracing and that this would likely be going on for you know, several years if the patient has several years left in growth. So the other question is going to be how often and how long are we going to be wearing the brace? Well, the brace is something that's going to be worn every day. Yes, that's every single day. And we found from several studies that it is really important that the patient be compliant with brace wear. And I always tell my patients, bracing, it's not fun. Because the brace is made to correct the scoliotic curvature, it is not super comfortable. Um, they tend to push in certain areas, and sometimes after getting a brace, they need some adjustments initially to make it comfortable for them. After they get their brace, many physicians will have them come back and get an x-ray while in the brace to ensure that they're getting the correction that they would like to have in the brace and that it's fitting appropriately. So your physician will prescribe you a length of time for you to wear the brace every day. Physicians are gonna vary um, in the amount of time that they recommend. Some physicians discuss just doing nighttime bracing. Most physicians are gonna discuss with you having something from 18 to 23 hours a day in the brace. And um, allowing you to come out of the brace for activities and um, for bathing. So to get into the braced study seen on this slide, it's going to discuss why we use bracing um, as opposed to just observing patients. Well, the brace study was a large study, multi-centered, that had a lot of patients that were treated with bracing versus just observation for the curves in the 25 to the 45 degrees of Cobb angle. And we found that 75% of the patients that were treated in the brace did not have curve progression that would make them have to have surgery on their backs, and that was at the end of growth, versus 42% in the observation only group. So there was a significant difference in the patients that were being braced and preventing them from having significant curve progression and having them have to have surgery for their scoliosis. Um, because of that, the study was actually discontinued in favor of having um, patients with curves 25 to 45 degrees all be treated embracing because of how successful the treatment was. So as I was indicating a minute ago, the success of brace treatment is based on the patient's compliance. Several studies have been looking at the uh, amount of time patients are spending in the brace to the success of treatment embracing. Wearing a brace, more than an average of 13 hours per day was associated with success rates of 90% to 93%. So that's great success that we can potentially have if the patient wears the brace. So again, time in the brace definitely matters. And another study, they found that 82% of the patient who wore the braces for more than 12 hours per day, their curves did not progress. While 31% of those who wore the brace less than seven hours, had progression. So what I explain to my patients is if you're wearing your brace six, seven, eight hours, but not really a ton, it's almost like not wearing the brace at all. So if you're going to do bracing, you definitely have to dedicate to it and make sure you're going to put in the time so that you can have success. The last part of treatment for scoliosis I'm going to discuss is surgery. Surgery is reserved for curves that are between 45 to 50 degrees or greater. The question would be, why do surgery? The reason that we do surgery once curves reach that level of uh, curvature is to prevent continued progression. 
we know that once curves are 50 degrees, even after the patient is done growing, that the curve will continue to progress. And so if the curve continues to progress, we know that this can cause issues down the line for the patient. So the second reason is to prevent pain. Again, in the greater uh, degrees of curvature, we know that patients can have acute or chronic pain issues with the back, as well as degenerative disc disease. And so because of that, we make the recommendation to do surgery to avoid these complications. Cardiopulmonary complications are usually not noted until a significant curvature over 90 degrees. So less worried about the heart or the lungs, but more worried about the fact that the spine's gonna continue to get worse and that they may have issues with pain and disc disease in the future. So what are the goals of surgery? One's gonna be correction of the spinal curvature. The, the uh, surgeon's not gonna attempt to correct this all the way to zero degrees, but you will notice a significant correction from the curvature that they begin with before surgery. The second goal is gonna be prevention of the progression of the spinal curvature by achieving what we call a fusion. So the surgery is called spinal fusion. So the spine bones, which are vertebra, are first realigned, and this is done by putting in metal implants. The implants are going to potentially include wires, hooks, screws, and then long rods that are placed at each of the levels in order to uh, hold the realignment of the spine in place. These are holding the spine aligned until the fusion is achieved. So fusion is where the bones of the spine or the vertebra are actually joined together to create one long solid bone. We do this by um, placing bone graft between the vertebra and allowing it to heal together, just like you would a fracture. And so the goal is for all that portion of the spine, which is corrected and has the implants and the bone graft in position, is to fuse to one solid bone. Once it's one solid bone, it will not progress any further. So the spine will not change its alignment. So people often ask, if you fuse that part of the spine, how will that affect the patient? And one, um, as you may conclude, that portion of the spine would not be growing any further. But it is just isolated to that portion of the spine. The levels of the spine that are not fused would continue to grow, as well as the patient will continue to grow through their pelvis, legs, and all the other bones in their body. So the patient will continue to get taller even after spinal fusion is performed. Number two, a question that I get asked a lot as well is, will it affect the range of motion of the back? And the answer is that it depends on which levels are fused. The portion of the spine that has ribs connected to the uh, vertebra or bones of the spine is pretty rigid because it's connected to the rib cage. Now below that, the lumbar spine is our more flexible portion of the spine. And so if a significant portion of the lumbar spine is fused, that can change the motion in the spine. Because of that, when we do surgery, we try to keep as many levels out of the fusion as possible while still achieving our goal of correcting the curve and preventing any progression. So we try to save you as much motion as we can. So on this slide, I'll talk about recovery from surgery. Uh, the patients are actually able to walk one to two days after surgery. I think many people think that after surgery like that, that the patient will be stuck in bed and unable to walk. We actually don't do any bracing after the surgery and patients, I encourage them to walk the first day after surgery if they feel up to it. We definitely want them moving to prevent any complications from surgery. The hospital stay lasts from three to six days. And it's a multidisciplinary approach. You have a lot of teams coming together to help the patient after surgery, including our pain service, our myself, the orthopedic surgeon, our physical therapist, as well as our nursing staff, all working together to help them recover. A typical time for return to school would be three to four weeks after surgery. 
Uh, it is common for many patients to get this surgery done over the summer since it is an elective procedure in order that they wouldn't miss any school. When done during the school year, they will often do a homebound type program for those few weeks until they return back to school. It will take six to nine months for a return to full activities. That's full activities including sports. Uh, depending on the specific surgery you had and your recovery, the physician will guide you specifically back to the activities you're trying to get back to and any sports that you're trying to get back to specifically. Here's an example of a patient that came to our clinic. She's a 14-year-old female who presented to clinic after her pediatrician referred her for evaluation for scoliosis after she had concern for spinal curvature on her annual exam. The patient denied any back pain or any neurologic symptoms. On exam, there was a significant spinal curvature that was noted on the Adams Forward Bend test. Therefore, x-rays were ordered. On the x-rays, it was noted that she had significant curvature of the spine with curves measuring over 50 degrees. On the lateral or side view, it was noted that she does have some flattening of the spine and some rotation of the ribs. Because of the curvature that was over 50 degrees, it was recommended to her to undergo a spinal fusion. As discussed before, with the goals of achieving correction of her spinal curvature and preventing progression of the curvature in the future. Patient and her family agreed to this plan and a posterior spinal fusion was performed. These are the x-rays um, showing the implants and the correction of the spinal curvature that's achieved with surgery. As noted here, this is uh, screws that are used with two long rods in order to achieve uh, correction and hold it in alignment until the final fusion is achieved. Before completing this, uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit about scoliosis and activities. The reason why I want to talk about this is because I feel like it's one of the most common questions that I get asked. And I, I really want to emphasize to you that the diagnosis of scoliosis does not mean that you have to limit your activities. We actually encourage you to be active because this is going to give you a strong back and strong core which are going to help prevent any back pain issues. Um, though it has not been proven that any sort of physical therapy or chiropractics do change scoliosis, we do feel that having a strong back and a strong core are definitely a benefit in our patients with scoliosis. Even after surgery, your surgeon will guide your return to activities and to sports but the goal is to allow the child to get back to as many activities and sports that they um, participate in before surgery. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is actually seen in many of our professional athletes and actors uh, and as well as um, pro golfers, swimmers, there are many people out there that have achieved a lot even with a diagnosis of scoliosis. Therefore, we emphasize to you, don't feel that scoliosis is a limitation to you and your life. We hope that you can uh, do the best and we're here to help you to live with scoliosis and do everything that you want to be able to do. So. I want to leave with providing you with patient and family information. A lot of the information provided in this discussion is um, from these resources, the Scoliosis Research Society and American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, as well as you can contact us directly at Children's Memorial Herman by following the link below. This will lead you to our uh, information where you can contact with any questions that you may have about scoliosis or a potential diagnosis in your child. I would like to thank you for listening today and again please feel free to reach out with any questions.